After 16 days in space, seven astronauts were just 16 minutes away from embracing their families. Their loved ones waited on the Florida landing strip, ready to celebrate another successful mission. But at 9.00 in the morning on February 1st, 2003, amateur cameras captured something terrifying. Columbia was disintegrating live over Texas. In 14 minutes of real footage filmed by ordinary people from their backyards, we witnessed the day NASA lost seven heroes who believed they were coming home. Can you imagine the agony of families watching this on television? What would you have felt if you were one of those witnesses on the ground? It is 8.44 in the morning, Eastern Time. At Kennedy Space Center in Florida, families and colleagues gather on the landing strip, ready to welcome seven heroes who have spent 16 days orbiting Earth. Space Shuttle Columbia is scheduled to land in exactly 31 minutes. Children carry welcome signs, wives have prepared their husbands' favorite meals, and elderly parents have traveled thousands of miles to be present. No one knows that at this moment, 200 kilometers above Texas, Columbia is already silently disintegrating. Mission STS-107 had been a resounding success. For 16 days, seven astronauts had completed 80 scientific experiments in microgravity conditions. Rick Husband, the 45-year-old commander, had led his crew with the precision that had made him one of NASA's most respected pilots. William McCool, 39 years old, had been the perfect pilot, handling every orbital maneuver with veteran experience. Michael Anderson, David Brown, Laurel Clark, Kalpana Chawla, and Ilan Ramon had worked tirelessly, knowing that each experiment could revolutionize medicine, physics, or biology. Ilan Ramon, 48 years old, had made history as Israel's first astronaut. In his personal luggage, he carried drawings by Holocaust children and a small Torah that had survived Bergen Dash Belson. For Israel, his mission represented a triumph over historical adversity. For his wife Rona and their four children, it represented a lifelong dream come true. Kalpana Chawla, 41 years old, had been born in India and become an aerospace engineer in the United States. This was her second space flight, and she had promised her husband Jean Dash Pierre that they would cook her favorite Indian food together when she returned. Laurel Clark, 41 years old, was a naval physician and mother of an eight-year-old boy named Ian. She had written in her space diary about how excited she was to hug him again. What the families waiting in Florida didn't know was that Columbia carried a mortal wound from launch day, 16 days earlier. During the first 81 seconds of liftoff, a piece of insulating foam weighing one pound and 670 grams had broken away from the external tank at high speed. This fragment, the size of a small suitcase, had struck the leading edge of Columbia's left wing, creating a hole that would allow superheated gases to pass through during re-entry. NASA engineers had seen images of the impact during the mission, but had determined it posed no significant risk. They had miscalculated. The hole was much larger than they believed, and during re-entry, gases at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit would enter through that opening like a blowtorch, melting the internal structure of the left wing. At 8.44 in the morning, Eastern Time, Columbia was flying upside down over the Pacific Ocean, beginning its final descent toward Florida. Commander Rick Husband and pilot William McCool were in their seats, monitoring systems as the craft began to feel the first effects of Earth's atmosphere. On the mid-deck, the five mission specialists were secured in their seats, excited to be just 30 minutes from home. Columbia, Houston, we see your left tire pressure, were the last words mission control heard from Columbia. The transmission cut off abruptly at 8.59 and 32 seconds in the morning. In the shuttle cabin, the seven astronauts had no idea their craft was disintegrating around them. The cabin systems continued functioning normally, and they probably didn't even realize something was wrong until the final seconds. But on the ground, across Texas, something extraordinary was being captured by ordinary cameras in ordinary hands. Lisa Whitson in Lubbock, Texas, had stepped outside her house upon hearing Columbia's sonic boom. She grabbed her video camera to film what she thought would be the routine passage of a space shuttle. Instead, she filmed multiple smoke trails dispersing across the morning sky. Rick Hatcher in Palestine, Texas, was in his backyard when he saw what he initially thought was a very bright shooting star. But when he grabbed his camera, he realized it wasn't one object, but several, 
all leaving white smoke trails against February's blue sky. His eight-minute video would become one of the most important pieces of evidence for the subsequent investigation. At 8.59 and 32 seconds, at 63 kilometers altitude over East Texas, traveling at six times the speed of sound, Columbia began to break apart. The superheated re-entry gases had been entering through the hole in the left wing for several minutes, melting the internal structure like butter. When structural integrity was compromised beyond the point of no return, the left wing separated, causing the shuttle to spin out of control and disintegrate instantly. Amateur cameras captured something NASA had never seen, the real-time disintegration of a space shuttle. Instead of a single white contrail characteristic of a shuttle in normal re-entry, cameras showed multiple smoke trails dispersing across the Texas sky like deadly fireworks. Frame by frame, the footage would reveal the exact sequence of disintegration. At 8.59 and 32 seconds, the first separation is visible in the video. At 9.00 and 2 seconds, multiple fragments are clearly visible, each leaving its own smoke trail. At 9.00 and 18 seconds, the main trail completely fades. At 9.12 and 39 seconds, the last telemetry signal is received from any Columbia fragment. At Mission Control Center in Houston, screens went blank one by one. Flight Fido. Go Fido. We lost telemetry from Columbia. Flight controllers knew something catastrophic had occurred, but still held hope. Maybe it was just a communication problem. Maybe Columbia would land silently at Kennedy as it had done so many times before. But at Kennedy, the astronauts' families began to realize something was terribly wrong. Columbia should have appeared on the horizon at 9.14 in the morning, creating its characteristic double sonic boom as it broke the sound barrier. But the sky remained silent. Evelyn Husband, wife of Commander Rick Husband, felt a chill in her stomach as minutes passed without signs of the shuttle. Amateur videos began appearing on Texas local news within minutes of the event. Television stations in Dallas, Houston, and Austin interrupted their morning programming with grainy images of multiple smoke trails crossing the sky. Local meteorologists, initially confused, began to realize they were seeing something much more serious than an atmospheric phenomenon. CNN was the first national network to interrupt regular programming. At 9.15 in the morning, Walter Cronkite, the legendary journalist who had covered the space program since its inception, appeared on screen to confirm what millions of Americans were already beginning to fear. Images of fragments falling from the sky over Texas were being broadcast live to the entire world. The astronauts' families, who had been discreetly moved to a private room at Kennedy when Columbia didn't appear at the scheduled time, watched the news on television along with the rest of the world. The images of fragments falling from the sky told them what NASA officials couldn't yet officially confirm. Sandy Anderson, wife of Michael Anderson, collapsed into a chair while watching the smoke trails on screen. June Scobie Rogers, widow of Challenger's commander, was present to comfort the families, understanding their pain in a way no one else could. In Texas, the largest debris search in American history began. More than 2,000 Columbia fragments were scattered across Texas and Louisiana, covering an area of 2.3 million acres. 84,000 volunteers joined the search, including park rangers, FBI agents, military personnel, and civilians who simply wanted to help. Some fragments weighed more than 1,000 pounds. Others were as small as coins. Among the recovered debris were deeply personal objects that told the story of seven extraordinary lives. Rick Husband's helmet was found in a field near Hempel, Texas. A videotape by Laurel Clark, recorded for her son during the mission, survived intact. Kalpana Chawla's experiments, designed to help future astronauts live in space during long missions to Mars, were recovered in fragments. The investigation that followed revealed a devastating truth. The accident could have been prevented. Satellite images taken during the mission had clearly shown damage to the left wing, but NASA engineers had underestimated its severity. If they had understood the magnitude of the problem, options were available. A rescue mission using Shuttle Atlantis, improvised repairs in space, or using the International Space Station as shelter while organizing a rescue. But those options were never seriously considered because NASA's culture had normalized foam impacts as maintenance issues rather than safety threats. 
The same mentality that had led to the Challenger accident 17 years earlier had contributed to Columbia's loss. Amateur videos became crucial evidence for the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. Frame by frame, engineers analyzed every second of disintegration to understand exactly what had failed and in what order. Home recordings provided data that no NASA sensors had captured, allowing investigators to reconstruct Columbia's final moments with scientific precision. The impact on the American space program was immediate and profound. The shuttle program was suspended for two and a half years while NASA completely redesigned its safety procedures. Columbia never flew again. Its siblings Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor were extensively modified before returning to service. New orbital inspection techniques, emergency repair systems, and rescue protocols were implemented. But more important than technical changes was the fundamental shift in NASA's safety culture. The agency recognized it had developed a dangerous mentality where known problems were accepted as normal risks instead of being treated as serious threats. Columbia's loss forced a complete reevaluation of how NASA assessed and managed risk. The legacy of Columbia's seven astronauts lives on in every subsequent space mission. Their names are engraved in the hero's mirror at Kennedy Space Center, alongside those of the Apollo 1 and Challenger crews. Every February 1st, NASA observes a day of remembrance, honoring all who have given their lives for space exploration. Rick Husband had planned to take his two children, Matthew and Laura, fishing that weekend. Instead, he became the symbol of serene leadership under pressure, his calm voice in cabin recordings reminding us that even facing the unknown, some maintain their grace. William McCool, who had dreamed of flying since childhood, had become one of NASA's most promising pilots. His technical precision and passion for flight inspired a new generation of aviators. Kalpana Chawla had become a symbol of hope for millions of young women in India and around the world, demonstrating that dreams have no geographical or gender boundaries. Laurel Clark had planned to use her medical experience to help design life support systems for future Mars missions. David Brown had been working on experiments that could have revolutionized cancer treatment. Michael Anderson had been a beloved mentor to younger astronauts, known for his quiet wisdom and gentle humor. Ilan Ramon had carried to space a mezuzah that had belonged to a rabbi who died at Bergen-Belsen, completing a symbolic circle from the depths of human despair to the heights of human aspiration. His presence on the mission had represented humanity's capacity to overcome its darkest history and reach for the stars. The 14 minutes of footage captured by amateur cameras have become one of the most studied documents in space exploration history. Every frame has been analyzed not only by safety researchers, but by historians who understand they were witnessing the end of an era. Columbia had been the first space shuttle to fly, completing its maiden mission on April 12, 1981. 22 years later, it became the second shuttle lost, taking with it part of American optimism about space exploration. But Columbia also taught us something important about human nature. In its final moments, inadvertently captured by civilian cameras, we see both the fragility and grandeur of human ambition. Seven people had dedicated their lives to pushing the limits of the possible, knowing that space forgives no mistakes. Their sacrifice was not in vain if we learn from it, if we use their lessons to make space safer for those who will come after. Columbia taught us that even in the space age, we remain vulnerable to the smallest details. A piece of foam weighing less than two pounds ended the lives of seven extraordinary people who dedicated everything to pushing the limits of what is humanly possible. Their final 16 minutes were captured by ordinary cameras in ordinary hands, turning casual witnesses into chroniclers of a tragedy that changed space exploration forever. In the comments, tell us, how do you think the families found strength to move forward? What inspires you about these astronauts who knew the risks but kept pursuing the stars? If this analysis helped you better understand this historic moment, share it to honor the memory of Rick, William, Michael, Kalpana, David, Laurel, and Ilan.